Hey everybody, it is the Kung Fu Genius, aka Alex Richter, one half of the awesome duo of the Dudes of Kung Fu podcast. And as always, if you like what I do here, please don't forget to subscribe to the Kung Fu Genius and also hit that bell for notifications. So for today's Kung Fu Genius episode, I thought I'd do a little something different. Instead of me doing a produced episode where you just hear me talk all the time, I thought, why don't I show you guys my recent interview with Sifu David Peterson on the Dudes of Kung Fu podcast. By the way, before you say anything, yes, I gave myself this haircut. Hey, I only said I'm the Kung Fu genius. I never said I'm the self haircut genius. So Sifu David Peterson really doesn't need any introduction. He's one of the uh, most prominent students of the legendary Sifu Wong Sun Leung. And pretty much everyone who's been around the Wing Chun block should know who he is. Anyway, I had a chance to sit with him. He's a good friend of mine. Met him once in Hong Kong. Did a podcast with him on Dudes a couple years back. We had been long overdue for a conversation. So without any further ado, check out my interview on Dudes of Kung Fu, Quarantine Conversations with Sifu David Peterson. And every day, I practice martial arts. Word is, I'm a kung fu genius. Hey, Sifu Peterson, great to see you again. How are you doing? I'm very well, and you? Good, good, good. Uh, it's always uh, nice to be able to do this. We have the 12-hour time difference, so it's a, a little bit challenging. So thank you for getting up in the morning to do this. That's no, okay. No problem. I enjoy having a chat with you. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. I think it was the first season of Dudes of Kung Fu we had you on. And uh, people yeah, that's right. constantly asked to, to have you back. And uh, we just have a hard time getting guests on because of the time. We always have to do it kind of, you know, these odd times. So I'm really happy to be able to do this. So thanks for coming on. So um, I just want to talk about something real quick. Recently, Sifu Hokam Ming passed a uh, very senior student in the Yip Man family. Did you, had you ever met Sifu Hokam Ming? As far as I recall, uh, I haven't met him personally, as in go up and say hi and shake his hand. I think he might have been in attendance at one or two of the functions that I attended years ago, but uh, I never had the real pleasure of meeting him face to face. So uh, sad news to hear that he was gone because there's not many of the first generation left now. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, uh, it's unfortunately, uh, yes, kind of a thing. Every, every year, every few months, we hear of another one passing. And it's just, mm. unfortunately, a matter of time until that, that, that piece of history is, is gone, gone forever. Um, yeah. I, I wanted to ask you something because, uh, of course, th there's some uh, very widely circulated photos of uh, your Sifu, Wong, the late Wong Chun Leung, on the set of Enter the Dragon, with his mm -hmm. student Wan Kam Leung there, and there was obviously there was some kind of test footage there with someone else. But like, uh, what like, what what were actually the circumstances? So why did you see Vu go on the set that day? What was there? Were they filming something? Were they had they planned to do something? Is there anything you can tell us a little bit about why your Sifu was there on the set of Enter the Dragon on that one day? I can indeed. Uh, what happened was that Bruce actually closed the set down for a day, despite the fact that they were already running behind schedule and, and it was costing money because he was quite determined to try to get my Sifu to be in a movie with him. His original intention apparently was to have my Sifu being the last opponent in the Game of Death film, which obviously was never completed during his lifetime. And my Sifu was debating it because his attitude was, he was going to be the bad guy and therefore that meant he was probably going to die <laughs> and he didn't want to die in the very first movie that he went into. So as a means of trying to convince him that it'd be cool, Bruce invited him onto the set and he took one gum down with him on the day. And what you see in those little clips that are, have survived in the photos that have survived is a little bit of an exchange between C4 and one of the, uh, the stunt actors. Uh, I think his name is Joey Chen. And uh, Wan Gam Leung doing a bit of work with Sifu and with, uh, uh, I think, with the stuntman as well and taking some punches from Bruce Lee. And there's a, a very brief shot where Bruce was obviously demonstrating how to get my Sifu to react to a punch. Right. In uh, the typical Hong Kong style with the throw the head back and, and do all that. Sure. So that's the background to it. That Bruce was determined that he wanted Wong Sin Leung in his movie. But in the end, Sifu decided he wasn't going to do it. So it never happened. <laughs> that's interesting yeah i can imagine uh 
it's kind of a different world for people who come from the, the standard martial arts world and then the movie world. They're, they're so different. And Bruce Lee they're was very different. Yeah. Who kind of straddled both of them and, you know, was sympathetic to both sides. But I can imagine for, for someone like your Sifu, that would, would have been a huge commitment for him to do something like that. Had he yeah. ever ex expressed any interest in doing films, even, even, uh, no, later? not really. He, he, he sort of said that he didn't ever want to disagree with himself 10 years later. So that's why he didn't write a book. And that's why I didn't make a video. And wow. even the, the instructional video, the um, what was it called? Uh, the Science of Science. Infighting. Yes. That was almost put together without his knowledge because they invited him in to do test footage, which he was fairly wary of. And they shot a whole lot of stuff. And then he never heard anything back from those people. And eventually the movie came out and somebody told him while he was touring the USA, oh, I really love your video. And he basically looked and said, what video? <laughs> and then <laughs> found out about it. Wow. So uh, the sad thing was that he never even got paid for that. So that was quite a disappointment. Yeah, I heard about that. Wasn't that was weren't those produced by seasonal films? Those those. Yep, that's right. Yeah. And they also and, did the the Taekwondo one with Huang Changlei, and there was that's right. There was a one or and there's two. There's a women's self defense one, that's, and there was a, right. a Hong Kong one with Joe Chiling. And oh yes, yeah, yeah. That's right. That's right. It seemed like they were trying to cash in on people yeah. wanting to learn martial arts by having these very highly produced. Uh, films. Yeah, and yeah I, I did hear that that your Sivo got a little stiffed on that deal there, which is interesting. I'd never, yeah. never heard the story there. Um, yeah, so uh, what I wanted to talk about with you as well is because you're also a huge fan of Kung Fu films as I am, and you probably have uh, a lot more firsthand experience meeting uh, some of these people as you've been to Asia uh, a lot longer mm. than, than, than I ever have. So I wanted to, while people are kind of stuck at home these days here, maybe give some recommendations for people to watch, especially, you know, the, the people who are kind of new to Kung Fu, a lot of the stuff that they see is a lot of the newer stuff, right? And, and I don't yeah. know, I don't know if you feel the same way. There's some new stuff that's coming out that's pretty decent, but I, I just feel that it, it's not really the same as the old days. I feel the, the old stuff just had a little, the, the fighting choreography was a lot better. There was a lot more quality that, that, yeah. that the actors were able to do stuff that the modern actors can't do. So maybe um, yeah. if you could give a couple recommendations now, let's say, let, let's go into genres like an old classic Kung Fu film, maybe a couple recommendations on there, like kind of costume period pieces. What are like, let's say your top three that you would usually recommend? Well, off the top of my head straight away, the, the one that I always tell people who know nothing about Hong Kong cinema and Asian action cinema is start with Eastern Condors, the Sammo Hong film. Yes. That has got a little bit of everything and it's brilliantly put together. It's one of the greatest action films ever made as far as I'm concerned. And yes. certainly some of Sammo's best work ever with Yoon Wah playing a crazy bad guy like he's never done before or after. Right. Yeah, so that I one's incredible too. That. It's also the only time you get to see skinny Samo. I think it's like the only film where he he dropped a bunch of weight for that movie and he looked fantastic. Yeah, he did too. Yeah. And sadly, it also uh, features the, the uh, doctor from the killing fields in Cambodia, uh, Hang S. Mo, who right. was uh, sadly, I think he was murdered. I don't remember which part of the States. Don't know if it was Los Angeles, uh, in I think. Yeah. Los Angeles. Yeah. 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 Uh, he had such a tragic life, but he was, he really shone in that film. He played a great part. Yeah, it was incredible. And and I always, that was actually the first movie where uh, I had seen Yun Hua in so many films. And for, for those of uh, uh, our listeners who are, who are, who don't know who Yun Hua is. So Yun Hua is one of the Tatsio Fuk, one of the seven fortunes along yeah. with Jackie Chan and Sammo Hung and Yun Biu. But he's, he's maybe not as mm -hmm. quite high profile because he usually played the villains or he was just kind of a stunt guy. He had done yeah. the stunts for Bruce Lee and Enter the Dragon, the, the backflip with Bob Wall and the front handsprings over the monks. Yeah. Um, but the, I think Eastern Condors was the first time I had seen Yun Hua. Like, I always recognize him, and then you realize how good Yun Hua is. Yeah. Incredible. He's awesome. Yeah, really. And really recently, awesome. people would know him from Kung Fu Hustle, where he plays yes. the, the crazy... Uh, manager of the of the apartment building yeah the, hus the husband of the landlady there it was such a great yeah. role <laughs> he was which which leads me to a second recommendation which yes. would be um dragons forever which he also stars in along with uh jackie yun bill samo and benny akitas yes. in a great return fight with jackie probably the best fight they did 
Absolutely. I, I would absolutely. So, so far I'm 100% with all your <laughs> recommendations. Dragons Forever, I think, because uh, uh, Jackie, Samo, and Yoon Byu made a few movies where it was the three of them, but I always feel that, you know, like a Wheels on Meals is great, but I always feel like they were kind of figuring out the formula and they got it perfect in Dragons Forever. Like, yeah, you know, and it's, it's just been recently re-released on a beautiful Blu-ray presentation that's got the Japanese version the international version and the original Hong Kong version. So it's worth grabbing a copy. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I'll definitely check that out. I have my, my I think I have some old DVD version I'd gotten in Hong Kong a number of years back, mm. but yeah, I definitely want to get a good one. And also my, my wife is not a really big Jackie Chan fan. My wife's from Hong Kong. She's not like a huge Jackie Chan fan and dragons forever. She actually likes that movie. So that, that shows you that like that it must be good if my wife likes it because she's not well, like, the perfect, perfect birthday or Christmas present for your wife. <laughs> She would kill me if I got her the Blu-ray for that movie as a kid. Here, honey, there you go. The Blu-ray to Dragons Forever. It would probably not be a good day uh, at the Richter household. Uh, okay. So we have uh, Eastern Condors. We have Dragons Forever. And what would, what would, say, a third recommendation be? Baikatsu, Prodigal Son. Yes, 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 yes. The Prodigal best Son. Wing Chun movie ever. Hands down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think I think you know a lot of people. They, they the new generation. They know the Yip Man movies. Or I think the the first Yip Man movie is 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 the best of the series. Um, yeah. in, in at least the choreography is a little more hard hitting. The yeah. two, and three, and four. Of the story tends to get <laughs> no, and it's all fairy tale from us. <laughs> the second one on was <laughs> yes, absolutely. And absolutely. the one that does stand out though is for me is the Anthony Wong's uh, Wing Chun. Was it Yip Man: The Final Fight? Yeah, that, that's yes. a great movie. That's actually funny. Be about two hours prior to recording this, we did a live podcast on Facebook, and I I recommended that you know if you want to see a decent Yip Man movie, you should see Yip Man: The Final Fight because yeah. Anthony Wong is uh, he's not quite the martial artist Donnie Yen is, but he's just a far better actor and went through greater yeah. pains, in my opinion, and actually try to play Yip Man the way he was. Yeah, he even went to the trouble of learning to speak with a Fatan dialect so that it sounded more authentic, yeah. which I think is credit to him. Absolutely, absolutely. I always thought Anthony Wong is uh, was great from his old film about the uh, the the, the Tasio Bao. I don't know if you. Oh yeah, the untold know. story. <laughs> yeah, the untold story, right? Which apparently, uh, I actually, because I, I I go through these phases where, uh, uh, and for those of you who don't know, it's a movie called The Untold Story it was directed by Herman Yao, starring Anthony Wong, and I think it was one of his first really big hits, and it's a semi. So it's supposed to be based on a true story about someone yeah. who apparently hacked up a bunch of people and then turned them into... Uh, yeah, it really happened. It happened in Macau, apparently. A barbecue pork buns, right? Yeah. And then so... Uh, and, and then, of course, it's kind of like a horror story. And, and But I, I looked it up because I was so fascinated by this story. I think a few months ago, I went down a, a Google trail of like, okay, how much of this story is true? And apparently... Yeah. It, it, it's not entirely conclusive. So some guy basically murdered a family that owned a restaurant and then he took over the restaurant. Took over the business. Days, That's right. right. But yeah. it was never quite clear whether he actually put their bodies into the chasu bao or he had, because they had found the bodies like in water or something like that. So, so I don't Apparently know. Apparently he was cutting up pieces and flushing it down the, the draining system. And they found, that's how they caught him because uh, they found the bones on the beach and they tracked back and that's wow. how they caught him. What a wild story. So anyway, that guy later played Grandmaster Yip Man. <laughs> and, and, Quite a change of career. <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? What a, yeah, what, what, a, what, a, what a varied career. And, and in my opinion, did it in, in perhaps one of the, 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 best, uh, the, the best of all of those films. And, but Prodigal Son, I think, yeah, for as far as a Wing Chun movie and, and, and the story and the choreography, I think that, yeah. like, that, that, that's really, really quite, quite, quite amazing. Yeah. For me, the only thing that's a little bit disappointing about the film is that whenever that the character of um, Long Yitai is fighting, played by the, the great, the late great Lam Ting Ying, the action is brilliant. And yes. when Sammo is fighting, the action is brilliant. But poor old Yun Bill, he just couldn't pull off the wing chun. So. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, the the fight scene is like we have. Uh, it, you know what? It's funny. Uh, uh, until you said that, I never really quite made that observation. I felt that the last fight scene is kind of wild because he's like really angry because of. Well, I mean, yeah. spoiler alert: the movie's like almost forty years old. You know, because his Sifu was killed, and so he's really angry and he's fighting with a lot of rage, which is why he's yeah. sticking to kind of the the Wing Chun movements. But you you know, we, you're absolutely right because he's very overshadowed by Lam Ching Ying and Sammo Hung's performance. Yeah. The, yeah. The, the technical Wing Chun in there. The, yeah. 
Have you ever and seen? The, have you ever seen it on the big screen, or have you only seen it on TV? Yeah, no, I saw it on the big screen when it first came out. I'm that old. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I saw it on the big screen, but like years later, as a retrospective in a theater, not not when it came out. I think I was a whopping five years old when that movie, or four years old and when that movie came out. Here's a here's a off the record comment. I went back the next day to the cinema and knocked off the poster. Oh really? <laughs> yeah, the, I mean that movie was so so incredible uh, for its time, and it's and it's still held up. I think the, the story yeah. is great. It talks about Chinese opera. You see the choreography, the fight scenes are great, and and yeah, I think that yeah. is a classic that everyone who's into. Women and for me, the fight scene on the bridge between the Manchu prince and the character of Leung Yitai, that is the best sequence in the whole movie. It's awesome. Yes, because it's so subtle. It's like yeah. you, they're kind of you, it, it, well. You have the fight between his two um, his two kind of guards who kind of test him out at the yeah. beginning, and that's done almost as if it's not a fight. Which I I love when they they haven't done that in a long time. Hong Kong cinema used to do that, like the calligraphy fight scene between Quan Tang Heng and Lei Hoi Sung in Magnificent Butcher, yeah. where it's like we're yeah. fighting, fighting. I I think like. Only Hong Kong cinema came up with those kind of brilliant moments, right? Yeah. And yeah, you're right. And then when they come out to have that formal fight where he's fighting Frankie Chan, that is an, an incredible fight. Yeah, Frankie Chan also kind of outshines Yun Biu a bit in, in, in that yeah, film. Yeah, I think so, yeah. Which is incredible Like when, when you look at all of the actors, the, the, the handful of actors that made it in Hong Kong cinema. And then all these guys who were also great, but like Frankie Chan was amazing in Prodigal Son. He was amazing in Outlaw Brothers. And then besides that, he composes music and never really did anything else. And, and mm. you, you know, it, it, and that guy is probably better than, than the best American martial arts action star. And he could never yeah. quite get a foothold in, in Hong Kong. Agreed. He, he just never got a, a, a position on the top rung. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, the, so th those are, those are great cross section of Hong Kong films who have Eastern Condors. Uh, and then uh, your second one, Dragons Forever. Uh, Dragons uh, Forever. Yeah, Dragons Forever and, and then Prodigal Son, of course. So um, Shaw Brothers films, are you, are you a fan of Shaw Brothers films or? Uh, yeah, or I just, I just rewatched the eight diagram pole fighter for, to review for Wing Chun Illustrated. Oh, no kidding. We just the, watched that last, last week in our Kung Fu yeah, movie. The last, yeah. last film of Fu Sing. Yeah, yeah, that's, um, that, that is a crazy story. Uh, I, also, I also go down these rabbit holes about Alexander uh, Fu Sheng, or Fu, Fu Sheng as he's known. He was such yeah. an incredible star. And he was living in, so, I mean, I heard he was living in Bruce Lee's home at the yeah. time of his death, which, like, and he died almost 10 years, the same month that Bruce Lee died. That's why they thought yeah. the house was cursed or something. Everybody like said the house was cursed. That's right. He yeah. had a very bad accident on set at, in the early stages of the film. And from different stories you hear, he either broke legs or broke arms or broke both. So the production paused for a while for him to recover from that. And then he came back and they were halfway through finishing the film and he got killed in a car crash going home with his brother from a, a, a nighttime gathering of some kind. Right. And so they took the pieces that they had and they basically weaved together the story. And that's how um, Leon, Leon Gawe yeah. ended up with the, the Gordon Leo ended up with the role of the monk because that was going to be Fu Seng's role. Right, right. He was going to be the monk in the Shaolin Temple, but they had to change the whole story. Yeah, and it was also very tough for the cast too because Alexander Fu Sheng was just one of like the most beloved actors, and like everyone, yeah. I I've since met a few people who worked with him, uh, Lo Mong from from Venom's fame, and also uh, Siu Hao the, from Mad Monkey Kung Fu. And every time you ask, like, you know, what was Alexander Fu Sheng like? You always see that they have this, like, kind of gleam in there. Like, no, I've never heard anything. Like, no one has a bad thing to say about Alexander Fu Sheng, which definitely says something for someone, you know, from the... Yeah. Uh, from yeah, the, I think he was a very much loved star. And he probably would have been quite a superstar had he not passed away when he did. Yeah, His career absolutely. was really on the up. Now, do you... It's been theorized by some... Uh, you know, Hong Kong film experts and Hong Kong book authors, like uh, one of my friends, Rick Myers, he believes that if you look at the end fight scene of Eight Diagram Pole Fighter, it's, it's pretty brutal. I mean, with the, yeah. the holes in the mouth and, and, and yeah. it, 
somewhat uncharacteristic of Lau Ka Leung's films. Like, I mean, Lau Ka Leung has some violent films, but he also has a number of films where no one dies, like Heroes of the East. Yeah. Or, uh, it's definitely his darkest, most uh, gory film. I, I can go yeah. on record for saying that. And, and, and do, do, you, do you have a feel, because he was also quite upset, obviously, about the death of, not just because Fu Seng was a main star, but also they were quite close. And it's been theorized that he made that end fight, that, that end fight scene is somehow channeling his rage I don't, I don't know i mean it's just a theory i don't know if you look into it that way uh, as that final fight scene kind of channeling his rage it's certainly quite possible but we'll never know yeah, yeah for sure he's an, he's another one who's also also gone yeah. as well unfortunately i had a, a chance last year to be uh to be a fly on the wall with a mutual friend uh, bay logan who's working on a book project about um uh, about Lao Ka Leung, about Lao Sifu. So he's interviewing all of these people who had done films with him. And that's how I got to meet Siu Hao for Dim Sum mm. la last, last year there in, uh, near uh, Chiang Kwan O or something like that. And then just sit and listen to them tell these stories. And one of the most uh, fascinating uh, pieces of information that Siu Hao said, because we asked him about uh, what about like an eight diagram pole fighter, like that opening fight scene, or or what about like in Thirty Six Chambers, all these other films he was in? How how long would Lao Sifu make you guys rehearse? And he and he said the craziest thing. He said Lao Sifu was somewhat impatient, as you can imagine, like almost like a very typical Chinese Sifu. But they would they he would come up with the choreography. He he would do a run through himself. He would make all the actors run through it once, and then the next time they would shoot it right away. So it was like, that's the, it. <laughs> yeah, like all this elaborate, uh, you know, rehearsal time. And he said, and that's why Lau Ka Leung picked actors that he knew could pick up choreography very quickly. Uh -huh. He didn't want to yeah. waste that much time. But I just thought, like, considering some of, like, when you look in Eight Diagram Pole Fighter, they just have phrases which go on for like 30 techniques. Yeah, so it's very cut. intricate, some of the sequences. Very yeah. intricate. Really, really, really mind blowing. And, and that's why well, I was doing a live commentary and telling my students that you, you're never going to see films like this again because the new generation of actors, you know, they look good. Maybe they have good martial arts skill, but that like ability to put this stuff together in this kind of intricate fashion, I think this, I don't know, I feel that that time period is gone. Do you, do you have a lot of hope for the kind of future of? Asian action movies, or do you not look at it as no. as I do? I, I think that there's very little talent left. There's one or two people out there, obviously somebody like Philip Ng, yes, who's very creative in his choreography, and he harkens back to the old days in the way that he constructs a fight scene. But there's too much big money and too much special effects and not enough consideration for the action anymore because they figure they can make it in a computer now. So yes. it just doesn't have the same magic. Right, absolutely, absolutely. And, and I think- I think we've seen the golden days. I think they've gone. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so too. My, my, good, uh, my good friend, uh, Sifu Vincent Lin, uh, he, you know, sometimes when, when I go out to eat with him, I always have to pick his brain because he had done uh, Tiger Cage and he had done Blonde Fury with Cynthia Rothrock and, uh, and Operation Condor with, uh, with Jackie Chan. And so I, I asked him like, you know, what was it like those DMB films that they made were just so insane, the stunts that they did. And he told me that, uh, uh, like the story, and I'm like, this would never fly. This wouldn't even fly in Hong Kong today. This is like in the late 80s. He said there was a, a, a stunt they did in Outlaw Brothers where Vincent had to drive a car like that down the street. And he said, by the way, they had no permits to film on the street. Uh, they just set everything up and they're, they're doing stunts yeah. in life. They'd traffic. set it up, they'd do it, and they'd run away. <laughs> Which is crazy. Like they wouldn't do that in Hong Kong now. To think like that's part of the, but I think that's part of the rawness that like you, you're never going to replicate that with no matter yeah. how great the CGI is. And he said that, yeah, I, I forget the scene, but like, like he's driving his car towards someone and this guy has a, some kind of metal pipe or rod and has to throw it through the windshield while Vincent is driving. Yeah. And Vincent is like, well, I mean, you know, what if that thing hits my face or the glass breaks, you know, and they're like, oh, no, no, don't worry about it. He'll aim right for the center of the windshield. He won't aim for your face. And Vincent's <laughs> driving again. He's also, at that time, he was making money as a model. And he says, yeah, but if the glass breaks, the glass goes into my face. He says, okay, don't worry about it. Then one of the, one, one, one of the not an extra, but just someone who worked on the set took a, 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 a shopping bag, like a brown shopping bag, and cut out a little mask with two holes and put a rubber band <laughs> and told him to wear it on his face to protect him from the shards of glass. Although he's more worried about this actual lead pipe coming through the windshield yeah. in the face. But they put basically a, a cardboard mask on him and told him, okay, you'll be fine. And then, yeah. he, and then 
do the stunt, it misses his head just barely. And then when the movie came out on the final shot, you don't even see him in there. They could have done it with no one in the car. And it's like, ugh, like un- unbelievable. This kind of yeah. style of stunt making is really, really incredible. Yeah, so, um, okay, so uh, Eight Die Grand Pole Fight, do you have any other, because uh, we you know, the other movies you talked about were kind of more, kind of more modern, so you yeah. like Eight Die Grand Pole Fight, or what, are there any other Shaw Brothers classics that you Yeah, Men, Men from the Monastery. Which one? Men from the Monastery. Men from the Monastery. Uh, to refresh my memory, uh, which one is that? I can't remember the Chinese title of it, but uh, it's also one of those classic ones with Qi Guan Jun and Fu Sing, and, and I think, uh, who else is in it? Uh, uh, Guan da, not Guan da Hing, um, what's the guy's name? Chan Kun Tai. Chan Kun Tai, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. All three of them are in it. It's one of the series that Zhang Jie did when he was producing all the Shaolin movies. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Uh, I, I think the, uh, kind of the stuff before uh, like uh, Five Deadly Venoms and those, like I, I know more of Chang Che's later stuff. I don't know. I haven't. Yeah, it's, it's a pretty early movie. It was one of the very first of that series. It goes right back to the 70s. Wow. Yeah, I'm going like to I'm gonna have to go back and check those out. Yeah, I think the Chinese title might have been, but I, don't quote me on this, it might have been Hong Xi Guan Yu, um, or was it Hong Kun and Wen Chun or something like that? I can't remember now. Yeah, I, I think, because I, 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 I was going through the Shaw catalog the other day and reading the English titles, and then, of course, because I, I can read a little Chinese, not as much as you, but a, a fair amount. And then I saw the title and go, wait, 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 Hong Kun, you Wing Chun, right? And then yeah, so, yeah. I was like, oh, so I'll have, to, I'll have to put that on the list because the, the Chinese yeah, titles Fuxing, are often so Fuxing, different. Fu Sing trains his one inch punch so that he can defeat his opponents. <laughs> <laughs> That's about I the extent that of the Wing Chun. <laughs> I love that stuff. That stuff is so great. Um, on the, the, uh, the, time we had you on the podcast very early on. I remember that that episode was crazy because it was our first season. We were kind of new to doing the podcast. Uh, uh, I was in Florida. Sean was in New York and you were in, that's right. and I'm in Malaysia yeah. recording it at the same time. And um, you told a, a joke, uh, apparently that Bruce Lee had told your Sifu. Are you? Yeah. Oh, like his favorite joke and i was just wondering because obviously we have had a lot of new listeners and they're not going to go all the way back to season one to listen to can you tell this joke that bruce yeah. Lee told you siva wong so long because it's such a great joke well siva always said this was bruce lee's favorite joke and he used to tell it wherever he went and siva because of that heard it so many times that it became a joke that he used to tell too and essentially there's a young woman who's about to be married to her betrothed She's very much in love and she is very worried because her husband-to-be is a pilot and he's not a pilot in the modern era where everything's fairly safe, but in the old days where planes often go up and come down quite badly. And so she goes to her mother and says, you know, what am I going to do? Because I'm really worried about losing my husband. And the mother says, well, if you really love him, everything will be okay. Just go ahead and have a chat with him and see what he thinks about it all. So she sits down with her husband-to-be and he confesses his love for, for her, she confesses her love for him, and he promises her that he's only gonna go on one more flight and after that flight, there'll be no more flying. That's it, he's gonna devote his life to her, he's gonna change his career, everything will be fine. So sure enough, off he goes on his first flight soon after they're married, and as the situation is expected to happen, he has an accident. And he ends up being injured, but not too severely. He survives. He doesn't get killed. But he loses part of his uh, right leg. And when he comes back home, they settle down to a completely different lifestyle. Everything's fine. And after a couple of months, the mother and the daughter get together, as mothers and daughters often do, to discuss how's married life. And the daughter says, oh, it's wonderful. He loves me so much, and I love him so much, and we're very happy, and life is wonderful. And the mother says, oh, that's great. I'm so happy for you. And the daughter says, but there's just one thing. He only has one foot. And the mother replies very quickly, that's okay. Your father only had six inches and we were very happy. (laughs) That's such a great joke. That that, that apparently was Bruce's favorite joke, which he told everywhere he went. (laughs) 
You know, it's interesting um, because I, 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 the reason why I wanted you to tell that joke again, besides the fact that it's a funny joke, and it also gives a little bit of insight into kind of what Bruce Lee's humor was like. And I think it also kind of humanizes him to people who look at him a certain way. Like, you know, this, this was a dude who also told jokes, right? Uh, yeah. is, is, I don't know if you, uh, have, did you go to the Bruce Lee exhibit in Sha Tin? Yes, I did. Yeah. Which uh, I, for, I don't, for me, so for people who don't know, in, in Sha Tin in Hong Kong, the uh, Hong Kong Heritage Museum has had a display now for the last five or six years where they have lots of uh, Bruce Lee relics and things that, you know, used to be his and uh, that mm. Linda and other collectors have donated. So you can see, you know, like the claw from Enter the Dragon and you can see clothes that he wore. But I thought, for me, I thought the most fascinating thing is they had a, a collection of his books. And... Mm. Uh, behind a glass case, because I always find if if you look at the kind of books that someone reads, you get a you gain a little bit of insight into what they were like as a person, and so they have all these books, and obviously there's as many martial art books as were available in the '60s, which wasn't a, a lot, and books on philosophy and sports and stuff. But there was one uh, there was one book on that shelf that made me think of our episode that when you told that joke. There was a joke, there was a book on, on the books. It was very small and it was the Playboy, the Playboy Magazine's Book of Jokes, 1967 edition. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it was, it, it was just like, you know, like uh, apparently Playboy Magazine used to have lots of jokes written in there and most people bought the magazine just for the jokes, obviously. Yeah. And so uh, my grandfather become... almost told, always told my grandmother that he just bought it for the jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. And, and uh, apparently they, they would collect all like the jokes from the, uh, you know, the little cartoons for the whole year and then they would publish it in a book. And after you told that joke, I had always suspected Bruce Lee read that joke in that book because that sounds like exactly the kind of thing possibly. that come, come yeah. out of Playboy magazine, right? Yeah. So I remember putting those kind of odd connections together. Well, a funny side story to that is the fact that my Sifu used to tell that joke only after he'd been drinking a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the more he had to drink, the more he believed his English improved. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Which, so would he tell, would he tell the joke in English or Chinese? He would tell the joke in English. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's incredible. That must it, have been it, He didn't elaborate on it as much as I might have done. But sure, <laughs> sure. Right, yeah. right, right. Yeah, I'm sure your version might be a little more nuanced and a little more yeah. fleshed out, right? Yeah. But his way would be, he'd finish with, it's okay. Your father only got six inches. We're very happy. <laughs> <laughs> that is so great. That is so great. Yeah. So I, I, I remember I read a long time ago, I mean, maybe 20 years ago, uh, around the time that who <clears throat> had passed that his, uh, that his English had been improving to a certain point that he was ready to teach a seminar in English for the first time. I don't know if like, well, I, he, yeah. he was doing that to a certain extent, particularly in Europe, because when he had me to translate, there was never any issue because I could communicate with him in his own language. So not, not very much, if anything, was lost in translation. Right. But when he traveled, a lot of the people in Europe at that time weren't that many Chinese, except people working in restaurants. Yes. Not many of them were practicing martial artists. And so he kept coming across the same problem that someone would find a young lady or a young man that would translate for him or willing to translate for him, but they had no knowledge of Kung Fu, so they would get stuck and not really know how to translate the message into German or Dutch or whatever it might be that right. was the language that they were using. So in the end, he just gave up and decided he'd do it as best he could in English because that way he felt he could get the message across better. Sure, sure. Yeah. And so that... whenever, whenever we had some spare time, when it was a quiet night at the school or when he was staying at my place when he visited Australia, we'd sit down at the table and he'd be asking questions about English. And so by translating backwards and forwards with English words and, and Chinese phrases, my Cantonese improved and his English improved. Wow, that's incredible. Yeah. How, did you, uh, how, how did you learn Cantonese? Are you self-taught? Did you, because Mandarin- My is Cantonese is very much self-taught, yeah. Mm -hmm. But basically by being in Hong Kong with Sifu because I've never had a formal class in Cantonese, but I have a university degree in Mandarin. Ah, I see. And you and uh, did you learn you? I assume you learned Mandarin then before you learned Cantonese. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so that makes a lot of sense. Actually, from experience and from talking with lots of people in this in my field of languages, that's the better way to go about it. Sure. Sure. Because if you learn Mandarin first, which only has four tones and and softer sounds, it's a little easier to progress to Cantonese. But if you start with Cantonese, 
it's actually apparently quite difficult to go back to Mandarin. Yeah, absolutely. Which explains it's, why. Yeah, explains why Mandarin speakers can understand the Cantonese, but the Cantonese have trouble with the Mandarin. <laughs> <laughs> yes, also like uh, uh, I know this was a this is a problem of many Cantonese speakers who learn Mandarin is when they go to speak Mandarin, they will they will add all their little Cantoisms into Mandarin. Yeah and then make themselves more or less unintelligible to a Mandarin speaker. Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah, with the Mandarin as a, as, as a foundation, you have the basic word structure and, and you know, because it, yeah. it's very, very similar. There's some, some differences in Cantonese, but it's close enough. That it's I, close yeah, enough, yeah. Yeah, I can see that, that, that and, that's the reason why, yeah. And that's, that's the big advantage I had over a lot of the other foreign students was that if Siva wanted to tell me something and we didn't understand it orally, he could write it down in Chinese characters and then, okay, you now know what you're talking about. So right, it, right. it made sense. So it got to the point where we would almost simultaneously translate when we were doing seminars together because I understood what he was trying to say and I was on, on the same wavelength all the time. Wow, wow. That's so it was an interesting, an interesting relationship we had in, in terms of how we presented information too. Yeah, yeah, that's incredible. And of course, you're you're probably used to if, if you're in Hong Kong and you speak Cantonese, the kind of looks that you get as a as a oh, foreigner yeah. speaking Cantonese because most foreigners, if they speak Chinese, it's usually Mandarin. But Cantonese is you know it's almost like how like like it's a big deal. They get super excited when you speak it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Have well, you, back, you back, you back in the eighties when I was in Hong Kong, it, it was almost unheard of. Sure. And I remember one time I was in Mong Kok and I'd run out of film for my camera. So I went into a store that obviously was selling camera equipment and I started speaking in English first because I was more confident obviously in English. Sure. And uh, they were all sitting around, it was obviously their lunch break and they were all sitting around having their, their rice and, and noodles. And somebody said, well, oh. uh, so another, and, <laughs> and I just said, another damn and I just well. looked at him and I said, since I'm going to say young, <laughs> <laughs> and the whole I, I am not a, I am not a devil I'm a westerner right yeah. and the oh, whole shop just crazy. froze and I got the best service I've ever had <laughs> and I, I went back to the school that afternoon because it was in the morning that I was wandering around and I told Siva what had happened he said ah oh, it's no wonder they probably thought you were Taylo a cop <laughs> <laughs> he said look oh, at you got it yeah of he course said, of course white guy you got a beard and you speak Cantonese the only people in Hong Kong that look like you and do that a policeman. That's right. That's right. That is so funny. Yep, I've had a I've had a, a couple of funny instances with that. Actually, um, do you know uh, Do you know Bobby Samuels, Robert Samuels? I know of him. Yeah. I, so I he he um yeah he was a protege of Sammo Hung. He's an African American and he can speak a mm. fair amount of Cantonese. And it's always really funny because like it's one thing if Chinese get shocked when you know a, when a, when a white guy speaks Chinese, but it's it's quite something else when a black guy speaks Cantonese. And yeah. I remember we went to uh, Angela Mao's restaurant because uh, Angela Mao, the, the the former film star, she has. She literally has a Chinese restaurant 10 minutes away from my house here. And we didn't know about this until like about four years ago when the mm. New York Times did an article on her. And it was like, we, we had heard this rumor that Angela Mao had a Chinese restaurant in New York City, but it's like trying to find a Chinese restaurant in New York City is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. It's like, which one, right? So we found out which one it was and Bobby wanted to meet her really badly. He's a huge Angela Mao fan. And, and so we went, we, went to the, uh, we went to the restaurant. I was there with Bobby. And I had already met Angela once at this point. And she, uh, she's been in the States since 93. She actually hardly speaks any English at all. Um, she, she's from Taiwan. She speaks Mandarin, but she also speaks Cantonese from doing films in Hong Kong for so long. Mm. Uh, and so, uh, you know, when, when you know, I, I, I said hi to her, and then I know that she had worked with Sammo Hung and was very close to Sammo Hung. So I, I, you know, I told her in Chinese uh, that um, I have one of... Uh, uh, Samo Hong's Tongdai, one of his students here, and he wants to meet you. And she was like, oh, okay. And then in walks Bobby, who is an African American, and she's waiting. She's waiting to see for, you know, she assumed the guy was Chinese, right? And so Bobby yeah. walks, kind of like waiting to like look beyond him. And then Bobby walks up to her and introduces himself in Cantonese. And there was just this moment, like, on it, when she like looked at him and then she looked at me and she realized, like, you guys are all, <laughs> you guys are all completely, really, really, really incredible.
And, uh, but I think the, the best moment, this is why if, if you had ever, uh, ever have a chance to come to New York, uh, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take you to Angela Mao's restaurant because she's absolutely amazing. I would love that. That would be great. And if we go there on a Sunday, it's only very quiet. And, uh, and this has happened a couple of times. I go there with my family. She sees that I'm there and she'll actually go back and cook the food herself and then bring it out. So it's like, it's not just her cooks making it, like she'll actually make it for us, which is like, it's so r- weird. Like, you know, Sue Lin, Bruce Lee's sister from Enter the Dragon is making uh. noodles, right? It's totally bizarre. And uh, sh- one time we went there with um, uh, uh, Jihan Jay from Game of Death. Uh, yeah. He had made the ha- movie Hapkido with. Yeah. He, he formally taught her Hapkido for that film. Uh, so she considers Jihan Jay her Sifu. Because uh, she learned uh, picking opera in Taiwan, but she never learned a formal martial art except for Hapkido from Jian Jie. So she actually calls him Sifu. And she so respects him and so loves him and had not seen him since 1974 because wow. he had moved to New Jersey and she was in New York. They were literally 30, like about an hour, let's say 30 minutes to an hour apart from each other for like 30 years. And, and didn't, didn't know. know it. And we, intru- and we brought the two of them together uh, for the first time, and she was almost in tears. It was amazing. And then sitting there with Angela Mao and Jian Jay, that was like really, really incredible. So if you ever mm. come to New York, uh, that's definitely the first place we're going to go. It's on the bucket list. <laughs> Absolutely. We just, we just have to wait for all of this, all of this to yeah. pass over, right? Um, I have a question for you. I, I don't remember if I asked you this during the first podcast, but this is something that I've been, I've been researching uh, for a while, and maybe you know something about it. Um, mm. So Bruce Lee, in, in, in the very last, let's say, year and a half of his life there, so we're like talking 1972 uh, to 1973, supposedly had a very brief fight with an actor named Lao Tai Chun, who was another Hong Kong actor at that time. Mm. Now, um, I, I've, I don't know if you've heard about it. And of course, if you haven't heard about it, that's also totally fine. But uh, given that your, your Sivu also had quite, uh, you know, had a lot of contact with Bruce Lee also in that end, in that end time period. Mm. And did you ever hear of, of this fight between Bruce Lee and Lao Tai Chun or, um, you know, no, it's, it's, ever come it's up on news to me. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I had not thought anything of it because, as you know, as a, like a, you know, you you've been around a little bit longer than me, if I dare say so. Just uh, a little bit. <laughs> you know, uh, you always hear stories like, "Oh, yeah, Bruce Lee fought this guy, or this guy beat up Bruce Lee," or Bruce, yeah, and you hear this stuff, and you, you kind of like filter it out because it's like if you haven't heard it from a legit source, it's yeah. just you know, there, there's a guy in Brooklyn who'll tell you that the you know I, I, the triads killed Bruce Lee. They stabbed him with a knife and they changed. His, you know, there's always someone who's got a story, right? Yeah. But, Apparently, there was an actor, uh, Lao Tai Chun, who had made a number of action movies in Hong Kong, but he wasn't quite, obviously, at the level of Bruce Lee, but he was a former boxing champion. And he was challenging Bruce Lee openly in the newspaper and saying that his boxing could, would crush Bruce Lee's Jeet Kune Do. And I had heard some stories about this. Also, a couple of YouTube videos where some people talk about it. Uh, I, I didn't think much of it until I heard, I believe it was the Alex Ben Block telephone interview with Bruce Lee, where they did an interview over the phone. Yeah, I remember the interview. Yeah. yeah, and if you listen to it, there's a moment where uh, Bruce Lee says, you know, he actually called Wong Jack Man a bullshit artist, which I thought was great. And then he, and, and then he, he said, you know, there's all, all these guys, they, you know, they talk and talk like Lao Tai Chun. And when I heard Bruce Lee mention Lao Tai Chun by name, then I was like, oh, well, he mentioned him by name, so it must have been yeah. something. So I went back to the Hong Kong, uh, the, the Hong Kong uh, library. You can go on there, and they have an archive of all the Hong Kong newspapers from 1912 to today. And you can go in wow. there with Chinese keywords, search it, and all the articles will come up. So I found articles with also articles with your Sivu from the 60s, and so just what, whenever the name pops up, you can just find the article, and it's free for everyone. You can go to the, the Hong yeah. Kong Public Library page or whatever, and so. I looked up Lao Tai Chun and lo and behold, there were all these headlines where he was challenging Bruce Lee, shaking his fist and saying how he would <laughs> Bruce Lee and all this kind of stuff. And then the story supposedly happened that the, Bruce Lee had ignored it and didn't care and he was too busy doing his own thing and why would he care about what this guy has to say? Mm. But apparently it, it had eventually come to blows. And you know the story I heard, which I've talked about a couple times on the podcast, is that Bruce Lee basically 
stop Lao Tai Chun with one kick and there wasn't much and, and you know, n- nothing much to see. The fight was over very quickly. Mm. And, and he, he told the people who were there not to say anything because he didn't want Lao Tai Chun to lose his reputation so he could continue acting or something like that. But I'm always curious with people who have strong connections to Hong Kong. Like you have, some yeah. people have heard about it. Some people have not heard about it at all. And I'm just, I'm just curious. Yeah, I, I've, I've heard lots of rumors about various fights behind closed doors, but none of them seem to be able to be substantiated. So you just ignore most of them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's kind of in one ear, out the other. And uh, yeah. I suppose before before we go here, our, our time is almost up here. Uh, before we leave, uh, speaking of fights, um, obviously your Sifu Wong Sunlan was known as Gong Sao Wong, the, the king, king of talking with the hands and had lots of challenge fights with the other other Kung Fu styles. And, and mm. obviously a lot of this stuff has been talked about and written about. Um, but, uh, you know, as a student of, of Wong Sunlan, uh, uh, what... Uh, was there any particular story maybe that your Sivu mentioned, like a fight that he had had with someone else, maybe that he would mention more than others, like something that you feel was maybe was really important to him for whatever reason, maybe it was a pivotal, pivotal time in his career, or maybe it was just a big deal. Or was there ever one fight that he seemed to kind of talk about a little bit more, or was it a standout one even just for you? Uh, and could you maybe share that with the listeners? There was, there was one that came up a, f- a couple of times, at least in conversations over the years, whereby it was apparently the last time that he had Bemo and he had gone into the fight with the same intentions that he went into every other fight that he had, which was to test his Wing Chun, test his own integrity and his own ability and learn something from the experience. He never went into any of those fights with the intention of trying to hurt somebody. That just wasn't him. People often associate, oh, king of talking hands, then he must have been a really violent, nasty man. Actually, quite the opposite. He was a very gentle man. But he figured if you've got a weapon, you've got to make, make sure it works. You've got to keep it clean. You've got to keep testing it. And so he did. And in this what turned out to be the last fight, the last official fight of that Baymol period. He uh, actually, in the middle of the fight, hit the guy so hard that he cracked the cheekbone and the eye slightly dislodged from the eye socket. Oui. And because he was a short person and the other guy apparently was somewhat taller and he was hitting in a kind of an upward trajectory and it created a real, the guy rushed in and walked right into this punch. And Sifu wanted to stop the fight right then and there, but all the people from the other side, from the other lineage of whatever martial art it was, apparently they all started getting upset and it became a little bit of a brawl. So by the time it all settled down, it was too late to get the guy to the hospital to save the sight in his eye. And Sifu always regretted that so much that every Chinese New Year, he would send a red packet to the family to make sure that they had some money and that was the reason why he gave up the Bemo because he hurt someone very, very badly wow. and he'd never intended to do that. Wow, that's an incredible story. Wow. Yeah. That happened in the, in the uh, early 60s, as far as I know. And then he never had another fight after that. Not, not officially a Bemo fight, but he did have a few little interactions with people, sure. including a, an interesting one in Beijing on his last visit to Beijing. Some oh, I, saw, there I saw was, videos of that. He was also speaking Mandarin too, which I thought was, was quite yeah. interesting as well. Can you, yeah, he you want to talk himself about Mandarin by listening to the records of Teresa Dun, Dun Li Jun. No kidding. Wow. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Incredible. Yeah. But uh, the one that he had in Beijing was interesting. There was some guy attending the press conference and the seminar that he was uh, doing in Beijing. And the guy was mouthing off that, oh, the old man doesn't know anything. He's not that good. Uh, his reputation's all full of crap. You know, he, he can't be that good. And Chan, uh, Chan Kim Man and some of the other seniors in the school, I'm sure you know of Chan Kim Man yeah, and some sure. of those guys, Teacher they all wanted to yeah. Go, yeah, they all wanted to go and, and fight him. Right. And Sifu said, no, 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 it's okay, it's okay, let it go. And the guy persisted and he actually came to the hotel looking for Sifu. And they all stood in front and said, yeah, we'll do it, we'll do it. And Sifu said, no, no, I'll take care of it. And Sifu dropped him, 60-something wow. years of age, and wow. he dropped him off. <laughs> Incredible, incredible. Yeah. So even in his in his last last few months of his life, he was still up for a fight. <laughs> he didn't wow. didn't step backwards. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Well, hey, thank you so much for sharing those stories. Those are absolute gold. I think our listeners no are going to absolutely love that. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me, uh, dealing with the time issue and all this weird stuff in quarantine. I really appreciate it. it means a lot to me that yeah. you did this.
Uh, our quarantine has just been extended, so we're looking forward to another couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> maybe we'll do this three more times. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. This awesome. time next week. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, thank you so much for that. That was really great, and uh, uh, wish you all the best, and hope to see you at some point in the future soon. Yeah, I hope you're, you and your family stay safe and well too. Thank you.